Well, I'd, I'd like to start off by thanking New Harvest for having me be here today, um, and for all of you for coming to hear me speak. So I am a fisheries research scientist at a nonprofit in Gloucester, Massachusetts that's focused primarily on translating biotechnology tools and research to improve aspects of fisheries and aquaculture. And I'm going to talk primarily about the organization that I work for and the research we do and how some of the, the needs that we have also intersect with some of what we heard here today. So my talk is organized a little bit. I'll give some background on Gloucester, primarily because Gloucester is emblematic of some of the problems that historic fishing communities face in the current age. I'll talk about GMGI, then the value of marine research as a whole, research needs for marine species, what's different about them compared to terrestrial animals, and then finish up with some of the work that we're currently doing. So Gloucester, Massachusetts was a town formed in 1623. It's America's oldest seaport. And over a few hundred years, it commanded the United States' largest commercial fishing fleet. <coughs> it was also the most productive seaport in the country, and its productivity was important for feeding what was then a growing nation. Over the last 50 years, many of the ground fish in the Gulf of Maine have been depleted. The populations have been impacted by high fishing pressure, environmental changes. And that has resulted in a drastic reduction in the size of that fleet. For Gloucester, that means there are entire generations of young people who no longer have the same economic opportunities that they would have had 50 or 100 years ago. They don't have the opportunity to be part of the sort of family business that their, their ancestors have been doing for a number of generations. <clears throat> so with that in mind, GMGI was founded by a number of biotechnology researchers from Cambridge who have links to the Gloucester area and local entrepreneurs to provide economic development to the town of Gloucester with the idea that research on the oceans can provide new opportunities for these young people. We do that in three ways. The first is through education. The Gloucester Biotechnology Academy is a vocational training program that trains high school age students to work in biotechnology labs in the Cambridge and Boston area. We also have a research institute on Gloucester Harbor that focuses on using genomics and translating biotechnology tools to ocean discovery. And we work to develop a scientific community through collaborators that brings increased scientific presence to the Gloucester and Cape Ann area. As I said, we focus primarily on marine issues. The marine environment is really the final frontier for discovery on our planet. Marine species are particularly interesting because they have a number of really interesting adaptations to their habitats that they live in. They have an incredible diversity of form and function. And they have a history of, of really groundbreaking research that has led to a number of really exciting discoveries. So there have been approximately, there have been seven Nobel Prizes awarded for research involving marine organisms. Primarily, those were marine invertebrates. And there have been a number of really influential supplements and drugs that have come from marine sources. So most people are familiar with fish oil. There have also been anti-cancer drugs, as well as uh, anti-pain medications that have come from marine-derived sources. With that in mind, Gloss GMGI focuses on taking those tools that have been developed for human research, those biotechnology tools, and applies those to marine issues, so ocean issues. But we also use genomics, DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing to drive discovery from marine sources, novel bacteria, novel microorganisms that may be producing really interesting compounds, and use those for the benefit of humanity, so the benefit of human health. So now I'm going to transition a little bit to the kind of knowledge gaps for marine research. The first one I'm going to talk about is the presence of genomic information. 
So this is a bar graph that shows the, the genomic information that's available for the top 30 fishery species in the state of Massachusetts. So the species that are current economic drivers for the Massachusetts marine economy. And approximately 50% have DNA sequence data available publicly. The other half have, have no sequence information available. And this has a, a limiting impact on both management and conservation of those species, but also on basic research. So understanding how warming in the Gulf of Maine may influence particular species of fish, like monkfish, where we have no DNA information available. That kind of research is almost impossible because we don't have the tools available. For today, I also have some information about cell lines. So this is a bar graph that shows primary cell lines that were from Cellosaurus that were publicly available for fish. And I wanted to show the difference between sort of aquatic organisms, fish, crustaceans, and mollusks compared to terrestrial insects. The insects obviously have a much higher publicly available output. Part of that may be because there's a a lower amount of research in immunology and cell physiology that occurred for marine organisms relative to terrestrial organisms. For those fish, the hormone fish, those cell lines that are available are split pretty evenly between marine organisms and freshwater organisms. But what's interesting is that approximately 20%, so around 30 of those lines are from fish that we would commonly consider things we would capture or culture for food. So fish species that we are interested in consuming or already have a market available for them. So I'm going to transition now to three research projects that are currently underway at GMGI. The first is the sequencing of the North American lobster genome. So the North American lobster is a, one of the most valuable fisheries for New England. Approximately $700 million per year in ex-vessel value for lobster that are fished out of the Gulf of Maine. The lobster is also a model organism for neurology and repetitive motions. And it's a crustacean. And crustaceans have really interesting genomes and genome architecture. So their, their genomes are incredibly variable. They range in size from a tenth of a gig to almost 50 gigs. They have a number of chromosomes that range from 3 to almost 200. And they also have supernumerary chromosomes. Or extra chromosomes that are variable among individuals that don't follow the normal rules that we think of when we think of a chromosome. Many crustaceans also have duplicated genomes. And when we sequenced the American lobster genome, we also found that the size of our sequence genome was about half the size of what had been reported previously in the literature, suggesting that these lobsters may actually be polytetraploid, so they may have a recently duplicated genome. That has important implications when we think about how long they're able to live and the low rates of cancer that lobsters traditionally have, and how is that extra genome information a factor in those types of biological questions. So when you already have a genome that opens up a large area of research that is available, so the Atlantic cod has had a genome for about 10 years, a little longer. Uh, and it's also an iconic New England species with a really sort of depressing history. So this is a, this is a graph that shows the, the landings for cod since 1850. And you can see that for over 100 years, that was relatively stable. And then there's a large increase in landings that's associated with uh, technological advancements in fishing trawlers and sonar. And then a drastic collapse that culminated in 1992 the moratorium on cod capture, and it hasn't rebounded since. So what we're doing presently is investigating cod populations throughout their range in the US waters to try to develop a non-lethal tool to assign individuals to their population of origin, sort of like a 23andMe for cod. <laughs> um, particularly in, in this, we're also really focused in this area off of Gloucester which is unique in that there are two species of fish that occur in the same area, but they're separated during times of year. So half of the population will spawn in the winter and half of the population will spawn in the spring. Otherwise, they occur in the exact same area throughout the year, which is difficult for management and conservation because we don't know 
how healthy is one population relative to the other. So by being able to tell them apart, we can add value to the types of biological questions that are asked and addressed by state and federal investigations. The last thing I'm gonna, the last research area I'm gonna talk about is aquaculture. So this is a graph that shows the production of fish in millions of tons by capture fisheries and aquaculture. And you can see that for the last 30 years, capture fisheries have been relatively static in their output, but aquaculture has increased precipitously around the globe. Now, aquaculture takes many forms. So there's offshore aquaculture in sea pens or offshore longline mussels. There's coastal aquaculture for shrimp, shrimp farms, um, and remote setting of oysters. There's also indoor aquaculture for fish, shrimp, and the shellfish larva culture, so the production of larvae. Even though those are all very different, they have some challenges that are associated with all of them. One of those is that they take a lot of space. They're big enterprises. They also have a, a high cost associated with feeding the organisms. They have environmental impacts. There's a lot of waste that's generated. And lastly, what I focus on primarily is in many cases, they have a number of diseases that are usually associated with them. So some aquaculture farms are associated with growing individuals in high density conditions. That can be stressful. And the contact rate is really high. And that can result in the onset and spread of a number of really devastating diseases. For fish, there are a number of viral diseases, viral hemorrhagic septicemia, salmon anemia virus, there's also parasitic things like sea lice or it's a protozoan infecting that fish causing a disease called whirling disease. <coughs> it doesn't just impa impact fish but also invertebrates. So protozoans that infect bivalves and a number of viruses and parasites that infect shrimp in culture and, and in the wild. So one of the projects we're focused on primarily at GMGI is developing CRISPR-based marine disease diagnostics in collaboration with the University of Arizona and MIT. We're taking a, a tool, an assay that was developed for Zika and Dengue by researchers at MIT and the Broad Institute and applying that technique to the aquaculture space to address an issue that aquaculture producers constantly face. So that technique focuses on using Cas13 which is an enzyme that cleaves RNA. It's related to the enzyme that people talk about when they think of genetic engineering, Cas9. It's really useful because it's activated by a really specific guide RNA molecule that we can use to create really high accuracy, high, sensitive, high sensitivity diagnostics. So those are called Sherlock reactions. The basic process is DNA from a sample is amplified, making millions of copies. Unlike PCR, this occurs at a constant room temperature rather than fluctuating temperatures. That, those millions of copies are transcribed into RNA, also at room temperature. And then that RNA is mixed with enzymes and guide RNAs and a reporter that's made out of RNA. And if the target, the viral DNA, is detected, you'll get a fluorescent signal. This approach yields extremely sensitive diagnostics that perform in many ways similar to what is now the gold standard, qPCR. So they're quantitative and linear. As the number of viruses increase, you get a representative increase in fluorescence, the kind of things you look for in a diagnostic test. So our hope is that as we continue to develop this tool for the aquaculture space, we can eventually create a field deployable paper-based diagnostic to give the ability to test for viruses and manage them to put that into the hands of the producers themselves and allow them to have more control over their destinies. So to conclude, if I could pass along one take on message, it would be that the generation of these tools for, for research in general is really important making things publicly available supports marine science and management. Benefit, it can benefit human health by driving new discoveries. And these types of outputs have the potential to 
revive, support historic fishing communities that may have, over the last 50 or so years, lost some of those opportunities. Thank you all very much.